Since starting the Dartmoor podcast, I've seen how Dartmoor can bring out the obsessive in people. The wild campers and swimmers, the boulderers, the letterboxers, the bird watchers, the kayakers, hikers, tour baggers and ghost hunters. But how about Dartmoor 365-ers? The perfect conceit of this book is as follows. Dartmoor is 365 square miles, and the late John Hayward, himself a Dartmoor obsessive, noted one thing of interest in each of Dartmoor's 365 squares. You see, though the moor might look desolate, it actually conceals layers upon layers of history. A military range built on a Victorian peat works, built on a tin mine, built on a medieval farmstead, built on an Iron Age fort, built on Bronze Age hut circles on a Neolithic stone row. Each of Hayward's items of interest has coordinates, like E6, and a page in the book telling you what to look out for in that square, often with a nice poem or illustration or bonus nugget of botanical wisdom. So, more than a mere book, Dartmoor 365 is a game, a challenge. There's even a little map at the front you can colour in as you check off the squares. And people might set themselves the task of checking off all 365 squares in their lifetime, or one every day of the year, or they might just use those squares as inspiration for planning an adventurous hike. A really nice hobby that's guaranteed to get you out to new places and stretch your Dartmoor horizons. And that's just what I was going to do. On a dry April afternoon, after finding a way to attach my stick to a mountain bike, I found myself on a train to Oakhampton, heading into uncharted territory. Welcome back to the Dartmoor Podcast. My own tally of Dartmoor 365 squares is pretty embarrassing. I'm only counting squares that I've visited since I bought the book a few years back, but still, that's a poor effort. I'm blaming my lack of squares on all the time spent birding, letterboxing, snorkelling and, indeed, podcasting. I cycled the amazing stick bike round the imposing northern dome of the moor to the picturesque little village of Sorton, as I think it's pronounced. The beautiful little churchyard was bursting with daffodils and the rustic jolly faces on the gravestones were still just as they were sketched by Hayward. Anyway, Sourton or Sorton, I can now just pronounce it D5 because I've just checked it off the list. But that wasn't going to be enough to fill an episode of the Dartmoor podcast. And beside, I needed to attack that embarrassing Dartmoor 365 map and get shading in those very, very light green squares. So I set myself a little challenge. I'd have one day, from sunrise to sunset, to visit as many Dartmoor 365s as I could. I would, where possible, have to visit the actual feature, not just walk through the square, and they would have to be new squares. So no points, for instance, for visiting Cranmere Pool Letterbox, which I checked off last year. I decided that the best way to get a good tally and set the record for new 365s found in a day would be to camp out so that I could make a really early start. With a long walk in mind, I'd packed light, just a sleeping bag, bivvy and roll mat. Oh, and my levu, so no tent. My first thought was to camp out in one of the caves on Sorton Tor, but I decided to push on a bit further to Shellstone Tor where I wouldn't be able to hear the motorway. Here I just lay down my bedding out of the winds, more rough sleeping than wild camping really, and made a cuppa. I made a plan for the next day's walk that incorporated 20 different Dartmoor 365 locations, from tours to railways to gorges to birds. Then it was just time to admire the sunset over Shellstone Tor and hope to get a good night's sleep.
Right. I'm going to break the format a little bit. Hang on, can he do that? Mostly uh, so that future George, who does the script and the narrating... That's me. Uh, maybe even future future George, who does the editing and the snarky comments... Um, they just might find it amusing to see the difference between what actually happens tomorrow with hindsight and here on the eve of the Dartmoor 365 adventure uh, what I think it's going to go like um, No, I don't like it, turn him off I'm feeling pretty chilled about it because I've got a really good plan I think in terms of numbers how many 365s can I pick off in a day uh, there's 20 on the list but there's no way I'm going to do 20 I mean, I'm not going to see a red grouse for starters um, but I think 12 anything less than 12 would be disappointing I think 15 would be pretty good there's some of them which are quite close together in like little clusters of threes so you sort of go three six nine quite quick <laughs> I'm beginning to sound like a bit competitive about it now, like just competing with myself, obviously, but I don't think it should be like a competitive thing at all. Dartmoor 365, that's not in the spirit of it, is it? It should be like just a day out, find something um, nice. I could have done that much more lyrically and concisely. And like all the best plans, I have plans not to plan every part of the plan. You know, I can stop at any point and start the loop back round. So, I need to see how I'm feeling. Am I really sprightly and going to just run up fur tour? Or am I just going to, like ages before that, realise I need to come back round? And I can hear the tiger's marsh back to the start. Yeah, I'll, I'll just talk over him now. He's just waffling. The evening drew in quiet and I watched the sun shrink away from the West Oakman Valley and Blackator Beer, then retreat over the hills beyond. Tucked away out of the wind, I dozed under the stars, still plotting and debating tomorrow's route in my head as I drifted off to sleep. And I would have slept well if my inflatable mat hadn't slowly deflated throughout the night. Never mind. I stashed anything I didn't want to carry under a rock with a little note saying I'd be back to get it. I made a decisive start to get the blood pumping. An extremely sharp and biting wind had risen up during the night, and the great broad ridge of Amicum Hill was going to provide a shelterless arena for it to blast at me as I picked my way up its steep sides. As I crested the ridge, the cold wind stinging my sleepy eyes, I spotted Branscombe's loaf on the horizon and headed for it. as incongruous a lump of rock as you're ever likely to see on Dartmoor. The story goes a bit like this. The Bishop of Branscombe was heading across the moor and was tired and hungry when a rider appeared and offered him some bread. The Bishop gratefully accepted, but just before he could bite down, the Bishop's page, noticing that the rider had a cloven hoof instead of a foot, knocked it out of the Bishop's hand and rescued him from the devil's temptation or some such. Where the bread hit the ground, it became this loaf. There is, as of yet, no physical explanation for the Petri gigantification process through which, whenever the devil drops anything on Dartmoor, it becomes massive and turns into stone. It seemed like an apt place to eat some breakfast, so I hunkered down on the leeward side of the loaf and tucked in. Anyway, D6, Branscombe's loaf. Done. A quick bob over the hill and I was on the remains of a railway, somewhat reminiscent of the one I walked in the Search for the Dartmoor Volcano episode. But rather than clay, this was a railway associated with the peat cutting industry that was obviously important on this side of the moor. And as well as being a check in itself, the railway led me most of the way to Great Links Tour. After a scramble up to the trig point for the view, 
I took a moment to update my map and have a quick cuppa in the shelter of the main stack. Three down, and another just a short shuffle away. According to the book, if I followed the path between the wonderfully named Higher Dunner Goat and Lower Dunner Goat, then I'd emerge at the site of Bleak House, a very out of place ruin in the middle of this marshy plain. This was lived in as recently as 1870, where it was the dwelling place of the owner of the peat working operations. But on the way, I had a really nice surprise a red grouse. These birds were introduced to Dartmoor years ago to be shot, and only a very small population clings on out here. I'd certainly never seen one, and here he was, proudly calling and displaying in front of me. I was absolutely buzzing, mostly because I'd seen a new Dartmoor bird, but also because it was going to get me another tick on the 365 challenge. See a red grouse on Amicum Hill. The book says you can visit Amicum Hill and see a red grouse separately to make it possible, so all I needed to do was walk back over Amicum Hill on the return and I could tick off F7. Get in. Other than getting slightly wet feet hopping across the brook, things were going well. But time was also slipping by a lot quicker than I'd expected. And this, I believe, is because I didn't factor in that I'd need at least 10 or 15 minutes at each location to film and record sounds for the podcast. I took advantage of a well-defined path and got a march on to tick number five. Brat Tor, or Bray Tor, is given its distinctive skyline by Widgery Cross, built in 1887 for Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. I have to say, I'm not a fan. The cross is pretty ugly compared to the older single stone crosses you find out on the moors. And there's something unpleasantly arrogant about this one too, don't you think? Tors are perfect as they are, don't go building stuff on them. And maybe it was then, with this blasphemous thought in mind, that things began to go a little bit wrong. I'd next planned to go and visit square G4, where I could read a poem inscribed above a famously picturesque bench, then follow the river to some stepping stones to tick off F4, high down Ford. However, I'd failed to do even the most basic of research to find out what side of the river the bench was on, so I had a frustrating moment of gazing at it from the far bank of the little gorge. I crossed up at the ford anyway, then walked a few hundred extra yards to collect G4, black stone, properly. All good, and it was a lovely spot too, looking up at Bray Tor. And the poem was a surprisingly thoughtful one about the transience of existence and the possibility of an afterlife. Are we not like this moorland stream, springing none knows where from, tinkling, bubbling, flashing a gleam back at the sun? Ere long, gloomy and dull, under a cloud, then rushing onwards again, dashing at rocks with anger loud, roaring and foaming in vain, wandering thus for many a mile, twisting and turning away for a while, then of a sudden it's over the fall, and the dark still pool is the end of all. Is it? I thought as I turned away and I turned again to the silent moor. Is it? I said, and my heart said nay as I gazed at the cross on which you retour. Next though, the plan went completely awry. I planned to walk down into Lidford and turn onto the road which I could follow for a mile or so, tick off H3, roadside information stones, Yes, it feels a bit like Hayward was struggling for something in that square. Then cut back round through the rifle range at H4. But when I got down the road, I realised I really should have checked. It was a very busy narrow road between steep tall hedges. I watched a lorry thunder down it and realised it wasn't going to happen. 
Not for a roadside information stone, certainly. So, embarrassingly, I had to walk back past the same sheep and return to Braytor. I was having to sacrifice two ticks and had wasted about 45 minutes on a pointless dogleg. Anyway, mental fortitude needed. I didn't let it get me down and plotted a new route up and over Dotor, then along the flank of Hairtor to take me into Tavy Cleave near Gertor. So many great one-syllable tour names out in this part. Part of the brilliance of Dartmoor 365 is the way it gets you out into places you haven't been before, and I was enjoying this strange part of the moor. The huge tours crowded together and jutted up against the horizon in a particularly wild and windswept way, and I felt very small and insect-like as I picked my way through the glitter or negotiated the brooks and bogs between the great peaks. And just when I felt I couldn't be any more dwarfed, Tavy Cleave opened up into an impressive gorge that underscored some of these tours, creating a steep chasm that rendered their previous appearance tame. The rocks loomed above me like fantasy citadels, and I followed the dark ribbon of the river Tavy towards its source as it rushed and bubbled past me through the canyon. And on I went, into the more gentle valley of the Rattlebrook. Then up and round past Observation Post 19 and into an area called Wharton Oak, a particularly dense area of ruined settlements. I had to accept I was getting tired. Achy legs, sore shoulders, but mostly I was just tired of the unendingly screaming wind. I ducked down into a hut circle, perhaps thousands of years old, and caught a brief respite from that relentless wind. With the sun out too, I could happily have drifted off to sleep. It was definitely time to start the return loop. It was late in the afternoon, and I'd be pushing it for time as well as energy if I were to attempt fur tour, so I decided instead to head back. I followed Amicum Brook up into a very barren looking swampy area and then kept going onto one of the strangest squares in the book, G7, Wilderness. And pretty bare and empty it was too, the only square mile on Dartmoor without a named feature on the OS map. By this point I was properly tired, my feet were wet and the utterly relentless wind was taking up all my energy in simply trying to ignore it. I put on sun cream, but was definitely coming out of this wind burnt. If only I'd had the wherewithal to notice I was wearing around my neck exactly the piece of clothing that has been used for millennia in desert countries to protect your face from said sun and wind. And maybe because of having to concentrate so hard on the boggy ground, or maybe because I was tired and likely a bit dehydrated, or maybe because the shrieking wind was driving me mad, I ended up among the silhouettes of those unfamiliar hills getting a bit lost. I thought I was climbing Amicum Hill for the first part of my return leg, but instead somehow found myself halfway up Great Knee Set before having to go down and up again with more floundering around in bogs and reedy marshes. I think I wasted at least 45 minutes and a lot of energy on this diversion, and it was a mentally challenging moment. Realising that I walked quite a way off course and would have to go back through the howling plain of wind-bent grass again, and I wasn't going to make my train, meaning another cold night roughing it on Shellstone Tour. Anyway, eventually I did get where I should be and used what was left of my energy to scramble up Amicum Hill. I saw the grouse earlier so I could tick this one off on the move, and then it was just a case of rounding Kitty Tour and heading home, getting properly wet feet now in Tiger's Marsh. I flushed plenty of snipe in my time, so I think I can take that one too. At 
As I got back towards my stashed bivvy, it was beginning to get dark, so I was glad I hadn't pushed it any further. Maybe if I hadn't wasted time at Lidford, and had navigated a bit more carefully out of the Amicum Brook, then I might have had time to do Fertor and Great Neset too. Some regrets. But ultimately, 13 in a day wasn't bad. My map was looking a bit less embarrassing, and I was feeling a little wiser about the northwest corner of the moor. Do you think you could beat 30 new Dartmoor 365s in a day on foot? I'd love to know what your record is in the comments. But ultimately, my big realisation from this journey was that Dartmoor 365 probably shouldn't be done this way. Making it a feat of endurance took away the time needed to really appreciate some of the squares, and I reckon planning a really nice day out with an interesting hike to pick up three or four would be perfect. It was going to be another cold night out on Shellstone, as it was too late to get to my train, and besides, I wasn't sure my jelly legs would take me much further. Never mind, I wasn't going to need much help falling off to sleep. Good night everyone. See you next time.